I'm Maura Fogarty in Singapore. The headlines at this hour. An extraordinary political comeback for Malaysia's former prime minister, 92-year-old Mahathir Mohamad, wins the election and promises to get back to business. But there will be no holiday for the winners. <laughs> That's the trouble with winning. You get to work. Three Americans released by North Korea arrive in Alaska on the first leg of their journey home. The White House hails the move as a, quote, positive gesture of goodwill. I'm Kasha Madeira in London, also in this program. From Yorkshire to Yangon, Leeds United play in Myanmar in a tour that's been criticized by human rights groups. And model members of the royal family, waxworks of Meghan and Harry are unveiled just 10 days ahead of the royal wedding. Live from our studios in Singapore and London. This is BBC World News. It's Newsday. And good morning. It is 8 a.m. in Singapore and Kuala Lumpur, where the new day brings a dramatic comeback for the former Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. His alliance of opposition parties has won a majority in the general election, defeating the incumbent Barisan Nasional, which has been in power for more than 60 years. Well, 92-year-old Dr. Mahathir came out of retirement to take on his former protege, Najib Razak, and the party he led for years. Here he is addressing supporters shortly before the official results were announced. Uh, so the chief secretary will announce that there will be a holiday tomorrow and the day after. Yeah. And also Saturday and Sunday, so you are going to have four days holiday. But there will be no holiday for the winners. <laughs> That's the trouble with winning. You get to work. Our correspondent, Jonathan Head, who's in Kuala Lumpur, was watching the results as they came in. These opposition supporters have been down here outside the headquarters of one of the opposition parties for hours now, listening to the results being tallied by their own leaders. There have been shouts of jubilation, a real sense of change being possible, and of course they've just heard their own leader, Dr. Mahathir Mohamed, the 92-year-old former Prime Minister who has transformed this election campaign, telling them that they now have enough seats to form a government. A tremendous excitement here at the thought that they might, against the odds, have built up enough support to overturn this government. And at the same time, there's a great deal of fear and suspicion that somehow, if the votes have gone their way, that the government may be able to steal the result for them. If it does happen, this is new territory for Malaysia. There has never before been a transfer of power in this country since independence. So nobody knows what happens, but the sense that they might actually have achieved this historic change has really given an incredible atmosphere, one of real excitement and tension and anticipation. Jonathan Head there in Kuala Lumpur, and we will return to get some more analysis on the significance of this historic election result in Malaysia. Now on to another major story that we've been covering. It is the release of three American citizens who are being detained in North Korea. Now amongst them, this is Kim Dong Chol, one of the three men who are right now flying home with the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Earlier, they arrived in Alaska just a few hours ago, and in the last few minutes, they've taken off from Anchorage. They are expected at Andrews Air Force Base just outside of Washington later on. President Trump has tweeted earlier that he will be there to meet them. Our correspondent Stephen McDonald gave us this update from Seoul. Well, it seems like they're in quite good health, according to the reports from uh, Donald Trump via his Twitter account. On the way back, the plane stopped in Japan and Doctors have examined the three detainees, if we call them. These Korean Americans were being held in North Korea, and apparently they're okay. You know, this is a stark contrast, of course, to the case of Otto Warmbier. People will remember this American student who was being held in North Korea and ended up dying upon his return to the United States. 
And when they get there, in about, well, by my calculation, eight hours' time, Donald Trump says he'll be there to welcome the plane. And it seems like, if his tweets or anything to go by, he's really going to try and make as much political mileage out of this as possible. He'll be there to greet the plane, to meet them. He's thanked his counterpart in North Korea, Kim Jong-un, for letting these men go. Uh, he's also said that the U.S. Secretary of State has finalized the details of the meeting and we can actually expect within the coming days the announcement of the place and location of the Kim Jong-un Donald Trump summit. Yes, well on that, the White House said that the release of the three Americans is a positive gesture of goodwill ahead of that planned summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The president has indicated that the time and the place for this summit has been agreed, but we don't know the details. We do know where it will not be taking place, and that's in the demilitarized zone that divides the Korean peninsula. The president has been teasing the media somewhat, saying that details of the meeting will be announced within three days' time, and President Trump added that he is confident about the outcome. I believe that we have both sides want to negotiate a deal. I think it's going to be a very successful deal. I think we have a really good shot at making it successful, but lots of things can happen. And of course, you'll be the first to know about it if it does. But I think we have a really good chance to make a great deal for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gina Haspel, Donald Trump's nominee to lead the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, has promised not to restart the post-9-11 harsh interrogation program. Ms. Haspel oversaw a secret detention center in Thailand where al-Qaeda suspects were waterboarded to extract information. I would never, ever take CIA back to an interrogation program. First of all, CIA follows the law. We followed the law then. We follow the law today. I support the law. I wouldn't support a change in the law, but I'll tell you this, I would not put CIA officers at risk by asking them to undertake risky, controversial activity again. Residents of Hawaii's Big Island are being warned of further explosive eruptions from the Kilauea volcano in the coming weeks. For the last few days, rivers of lava have run through residential areas and they've forced evacuation of thousands of people. The U.S. Geological Survey warns that more violent eruptions could shoot out so-called ballistic blocks, which can weigh up to several tons. The former Manchester United manager, Sir Alex Ferguson, is out of intensive care. It follows surgery on a brain hemorrhage. A club statement said that the 76-year-old is to continue his rehabilitation in hospital near Manchester. Sir Alex retired as United's manager back in 2013 after winning 38 trophies during 26 years in charge. And these are pictures from India. This is a father and son duo who have been paraded by police in their homemade spacesuit, allegedly after trying to trick businessmen out of hundreds of thousands of dollars in Delhi. Now, they claimed to be able to sell fake magical plates to NASA. The plates were meant to generate electricity from thunderbolts, but the uh, rather dodgy spacesuits somewhat gave it away. Well, Kash, I've got an unbelievable story for you, at least for the voters in Malaysia. It is our top story today, and it's the dramatic election victory for Malaysia's veteran leader, Mahathir Mohamad, who at the age of 92 has defied all odds to become the country's prime minister. Well, Trisha Yeo from the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs in Kuala Lumpur says it was very much an unexpected result for pollsters. It's been a long and sleepless night for myself and many Malaysians anxious to look at uh, the results. Uh, the results did not come in till uh, just a few hours ago. The election commission took its time to announce. Um, yes, and what really happened, you're right, that none of the pollsters and pundits predicted this. Um, you basically saw the opposition coalition, uh, Pakatan Harapan, or the Pact of Hope, uh, sweep parliamentary seats, um, state seats throughout the country, uh, defeating the incumbent Barisan National that has been in power for more than 60 years. Um, that is a very long time and their sort of dominance over the Malaysian political scene um, has always been seen to be or considered to be undefeatable. 
uh, this is the time where the citizens actually rose up and spoke up against what they felt to be a corrupt government, a compromise through many huge scandals. Um, you saw basically a, a 222 parliament um, being swept by the, the Pakatan Harapan taking more than 120 seats if you count the, the, the various opposition parties that are going into come into coalition um, against the Barisan National. Uh, Trisha, if, if, if I could just interrupt very quickly, the odds were stacked against the opposition alliance. and They've always been in the Malaysian elections, and especially with the redistricting and the redrawing of boundaries recently by the ruling coalition. How was the opposition able to pull this off? Um, well, you're right that the recent redelineation that was conducted by the Election Commission, uh, which was largely seen to be in favour of the Barisan ruling uh, coalition, um, would have affected even more so. And I think what the opposition was able to do was to change this despite the delineation that took place. Um, now, how this happened, I think uh, several factors would have to be examined as we look closer into the numbers, uh, but the first of which was the way Tun Dr. Mahathir, the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, came back from retirement from politics to hit the opposition coalition. And his presence alone uh, was a huge uh, determinant. Um, he managed to entice some of the biggest names of the old Amno Guard to support the opposition for the very first time and also convinced many of the, the Malay Muslim voters and perhaps more establishment type voters to, um, to switch their affiliations mm -hmm. at the last mm -hmm. minute. So mm -hmm. that's one. Um, second, I suppose, would be uh, the huge corruption scandal that Najib has been involved in or uh, allegedly involved in over the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One MDB, the One Malaysia Development Burhat, that, that's being investigated by uh, multiple countries around the world, including the US Department of Justice. Um, that really gained traction, especially in the urban seats. Trisha Yeo there sharing her analysis of what the Malaysian election result means with more a little earlier. Now let's return to the other top story that we're covering. Three American citizens who have been released from North Korea are on their way home. They're with the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Kim Jong-un agreed to release the men ahead of the historic talks we're expecting with Donald Trump. Well, Babina Huang is a visiting professor who specializes in East Asian security at Georgetown University. And she says that the men's release is a necessary step. It's certainly um, an important prelude to um, the, the historic summit, if it occurs, between President Trump and the leader of North Korea. And most certainly it's a necessary step to such a summit occurring. You say if it occurs, by all sounds, it seems that it will be occurring. We hear that we've got the place, we've got the date, we just haven't been given the details yet. Oh, yes, of course. And I think um, it, it's, um, it, it's uh, being cautious uh, for necessary reasons, because we, we all know that, um, uh, of course, these things can always go wrong. And I think it's important to be cautious, um, because we, we never know uh, for any sorts of reasons why these things might not occur. Um, and, and it's important to be cautious. Yes, we did hear Donald Trump initially saying that if things weren't going the way he wanted them, he would walk out. What do you make of this? Is this going to be a summit? Is this going to be a meeting? What can we expect as the result? Result of it. Well, um, because I think it's important to understand that the release of these um, detainees was an important prelude, but understandably, it's also because expectations now are very, very high. Um, North Korea did this for, for important reasons. It is a diplomatic success, but, but now, of course, the expectations are this that much higher. Now, of course, um, the expectations are high on the North Korean side, but now, of course, also of the world, because now um, President Trump will have to deliver. Um, this means that um, now the United States will have to deliver on everything. Um, that really now the United States will have to deliver on everything else that North Korea will expect on um, peace, on Re removing all the sanctions on um, providing the peace treaty that North Korea expects on um, you, you know it, the, the um, removal of U.S. troops probably ending the alliance is probably what North Korea expects. So um, this is very very high expectations. 
Now we're getting some breaking news from the Middle East. A couple of lines coming out from various news agencies. Syrian air defences are said to have confronted Israeli rockets on Syrian territories. And in the meantime, the Israeli military is saying that uh, they're accusing Iranian forces on the Syrian held side of the Golan Heights of shelling Israeli army outposts. Uh, no casualties in that incident. So a number of confrontations taking place. Of course, uh, a lot of increased tension following the U.S. pulling out of the Iran deal. So a lot of retaliation going on. But yes, just a couple of lines coming out from the Middle East. As and when we get more on that, we'll bring that to you. Well, you're watching Newsday on the BBC, and still to come on the program this morning, why this visit to Myanmar by the English football club Leeds United continues to divide opinion. Also coming up on the program, a view of the future from the world of art. We'll be exploring a new exhibition at London's Victoria and Albert Museum. This is Newsday on the BBC. I'm Maura Fogarty in Singapore. I'm Kasia Madeira in London. Our top stories. In a dramatic comeback, the former Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad has won a majority in the general election, defeating the governing party, which has been in power for more than 60 years. Three Americans released by North Korea have arrived in Alaska on the first leg of their journey home. The White House hailed the move as a, quote, positive gesture of goodwill. Now let's take a look at some of the front pages from around the world and the Straits Times is also leading on Malaysia's historic general election. Its front page says that the opposition party Pakatan Harapan has won enough seats to form a majority government with the results confirmed by the election commission. Lots more analysis on our website too. Now the South China Morning Post reports on a new hotline which is being set up between China and Japan. The paper says that this is part of efforts to strengthen ties between the two countries and also to help prevent any military clashes at sea or in the air. And finally, it's to Russia with love. That is according to the Arab News. Let me explain. It says youngsters in the Middle East and North Africa now believe that Russia is their biggest non-Arab ally, replacing the United States, which has fallen out of love. It's fallen out of the top five for the first time since this survey was started a decade ago. You're up to date with the papers. Well, Kasha, here in Asia, the Italian multimillionaire owner of the English football club, Leeds United, has told the BBC he doesn't regret taking the club on this controversial tour to Myanmar. The team has faced widespread criticism for traveling to a country whose military is accused of ethnic cleansing of Rohingya Muslims. Andrea Radvizani designed or denied he was putting his own business interests over the reputation of the club. And our Myanmar correspondent Nick Beek spoke to him in Yangon. The day Yorkshire came to Yangon, a hardcore of Leeds United fans made the 5,000 mile journey to Myanmar, a choice of destination which plunged the club into a political row in light of the country's persecution of Muslims. Undeterred, the visitors posed at one of Buddhism's holiest sites. The club's owner, Andrea Radrazani, claims the trip is about using football to bring communities together and not just helping his commercial companies. And what do you say to people who say you're more interested in making money than the reputation of your football club? We're not club? making any money out of this game. But you say you've got business ventures in the yeah, Myanmar. Yeah, but with other companies, but uh, of course I have uh, a different interest and I have a good relation with the president of the federation and we are starting a project from different years on the football pitch as well on the media and we're happy to visit our friends. And Leeds have been given a warm welcome by excited Burmese fans, unaware of the controversy. Well the match is now underway but what happens tonight on the pitch doesn't really matter. The more significant outcome is to the reputation of Leeds United Football Club. For the record, an all-star Myanmar side beat this inexperienced Leeds team. But many question the wisdom of walking into such a politically sensitive arena in the first place. Nick Beek, BBC News, Yangon. 
Now, just nine days to go from the royal wedding to the royal wedding. In fact, Prince Harry is marrying the actress Meghan Markle at Windsor Castle on Saturday, the 19th of May. Of course, we will have special coverage on the big day itself and also as part of the build up. But we received a rather special visit at our studios here in London. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can do all that. You can do if that. I do that, that's perfectly fine. Very few people get away with that. No, well, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm, yeah, no, I'm sorry to find it. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Well, imagine a future where intelligent robots help you with your laundry or even provide company in our often isolated worlds and perhaps even make cryogenics a reality. Our arts editor, Will Gompertz, went to explore the future at a new exhibition at London's V&A Museum. This is Brett, a robot at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence research. The idea is he's supposed to do all those household chores that we can't be bothered to do, except he's not very good at them. And that is the opening message of this exhibition, that intelligent robots are coming, but they're still a long way off. But that's not stopping designers from making technology that they hope will elicit from us a human-type emotional response. Meet Jibo. Hey, Jibo. I want to give you this flower. Will you tell me a joke? Sure, I got one. What did the zero say to the eight? Nice belt. That's an old joke. Will you take my photograph, please? Here we go. Three, two, one. Jibo is designed not just to give you information, but to manipulate your feelings. Whereas this piece of technology over here is designed to manipulate your body. You strap on these muscles into an area where maybe you're feeling a bit weaker and it actually gives you extra strength. And so this exhibition asks, as we integrate technology more and more into our daily lives, does it change what it actually means to be human? In fact, this show asks more questions about the future than it provides answers. Take this state-of-the-art driverless car, for example. Are we happy to delegate those life and death decisions which have to be made on the road to what is basically a computer? And maybe even bigger than that, are we happy to give away liberties which we've fought for for generations to technology? And then, of course, there is the biggest question of them all. What chance is there of eternal life? That's the question this part of the exhibition seeks to explore with anti-aging pills and brain scanners. All hopeful and optimistic, but perhaps this is the most realistic option, at least at the moment. The Cryonics Institute. This is the kit of parts you need for a shot at immortality. It has to be applied by somebody else, obviously. There's a drug which gets placed in the heart, there's an ice bath, there's a CPR machine, and then you get put into this white casket and sent off to deep freeze. And then at some moment, maybe a millennia away, this body can come out, be thawed, and who knows, be a sentient human being, when all the future that is described in this exhibition is the past. Stay with us on Newsday. We've got lots more coming up. Including Walmart is betting big on India. It's taking a controlling stake in the country's biggest online retailer. We'll tell you why. And let's just bring you up to date with the breaking news that we brought you a little bit earlier. We're being told that Iranian forces in Syria have shelled Israeli army bases on the Golan Heights plateau. Now, this is being told to us by the Reuters news agency at the moment. And uh, it's being described as in retaliation for an earlier attack going the other way. But of course, this is important because it's Iranian forces in Syria uh, shelling into the Golan Heights. Uh, not many, no casualties as such, as far as we know, no casualties reported. But of course, the moment we get any updates, uh, we'll bring those to you. That Israeli military statement coming 
to us via the Reuters news agency. Now, just uh, touching back on a story that we also brought to you earlier, some incredible pictures of a Buddha, 700 years old, never been seen inside, and yet when researchers took some x-rays of this Buddha, they found around nearly 200 items that could contain lots of different secrets.